statements, I mean, uh, excuse me. So it counts. Yeah, shut it off, turn it back on again. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm going to talk about uh, surveillance. This is my area of expertise. This is what I've been doing for 30 years. Um, this is what brought me into the industry, just doing surveillance work for uh, insurance claims. Some people have said my whole presentation, my whole training kind of surrounds around, you know, surveillance. I, I tried to change it a little bit uh, over the uh, months that I've been doing this and try to talk about other aspects of, um, of, the, uh, of being a PI. But, you know, surveillance is a big part of it. We use surveillance in so many different aspects of investigations. In the, in the manual, um, you'll see that, or in um, the, 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 uh, the book there, um, you'll see that I've been asked to do child support cases, child custody cases, when they're kind of battling over who should have control of the, the child. And... Um, you know, sometimes it starts out with surveillance to determine what the other partner is like. If one partner says, oh, he's a functioning alcoholic, you know, I could be out there filming him on a Friday afternoon, see if he goes to happy hour, see if he goes to the bar near his house, and, um, you know, what he does, um, and, uh, and film all that to show the judge, put together a report with pictures of it in there, and show the judge that, you know, from the time I picked him up from work, he went to happy hour, had a couple of drinks from happy hour. He went to the bar next to his house. Had a couple of drinks more, and then you know, at eleven o'clock, drove home, and he had you know maybe a total of seven beers and two shots, and that this was you know as the wife had indicated, this kind of the daily routine of his. Um, you know now, put that together with the fact that I ran his driving record and found out he had two prior DUIs and his license was suspended, and he's still out there driving. Um, now the judge is going to put the small child in the car with him? Hopefully not. Uh, if she wants visitate, uh, just uh, supervised visitation, hopefully that work that I did would help her get that uh, supervised visitation so that she can keep an eye on her child um, where he is at all times or where she is at all times. Um, in another domestic case where I use surveillance, um, the, the woman's uh, husband had said, hey, he needs a reduction in his child support. She said, a reduction? You know, we have three children together, and, you know, you're barely giving me enough for me to be able to take care of these three children. Now you want a reduction. He said, yes, I need a reduction. I got hurt on the job. I'm not able to do my, I'm not able to do as much work as I used to. Plus, the economy is really bad, and, you know, I'm going to petition the judge for a reduction. In my child support payments. So she reached out and she said, you know, I want to want to see if he is really not working. She had a limit limited funds. I told her, you know, I'd go out for five hours, uh, basically two hundred and fifty dollars, fifty dollars an hour. It was for a friend of a friend. Um, typically, you'd be able to charge more, but if you want to get a lot of domestic work, you have to keep it the pricing kind of realistic and enough for someone to afford. Um, typically, if you can, you know, if you can t get them to agree to a flat rate, and you're and you can work with that, that's probably the best situation to be in to be able to get a lot of work. So if I tell her two hundred fifty dollars, I go out on him six o'clock in the morning. He's in construction. I follow him from his first job to his first job or first location where he meets up with another individual with a ponytail and they talk for a little while and then from there he goes to another job site to where a guy's removing the fake brick fascia off the front of a house and then after that he then goes on to a third house where he himself takes out his own tools and goes in and works on that third house. Now these are three different job sites that I had identified within a very short period of time. As soon as he left the house he had an agreement to meet one guy who had a ponytail. The wife identified him as a known worker for her husband. The second guy, huge guy, 
he was also identified by the wife as being a known associate and worker of the claim. His name was Bear. When I talked to Bear, he had indicated that he worked for Blue. Blue was the nickname of my uh, client's husband. So there was three jobs. Removing the brick fascia off a home in Winter Park and then resurfacing it with stucco, that was going to be a big job, at least a $5,000 job, if not more. Um, the pony hair tail guy, I'm not sure what job he went on, but he met with him in the morning. You don't just get up and meet with your boss somewhere at a location and then go off you know, without a job assignment. Or, I mean, the meeting was for some purpose. Uh, I'm presuming that it was the meet to go over what he was going to be doing for the day. If I would have kept with that case during the day, chances are my guy, Blue, probably would have left his job and then went over and checked on the ponytail hair uh, uh, guy's job. But, um, but within that five hours, I basically um, determined that I believed that he had three jobs going. One of them was pretty substantial. When the court case, came, court case came around that morning, I just went by, swung by his house and noticed that he had changed his brand new truck, which was registered in his girlfriend's name, now had roof racks on it, now had ladders on top of it. So when I had originally seen it months previously, didn't even have ladder racks on the top, didn't have ladders. So it seemed to me, instead of a, a business that was in decline, he had a business that was kind of flourishing. And it turns out that his new girlfriend, um, actually their family owned a very large roofing company in Winter Park, very well known, been around for a long time. And a lot of times roofers go out, when they go to do a job, somebody will say to them, hey, do you know anybody that can do this? Do you know anybody that can do that? Or they get out there and they tell them, you know, we're going to do the roof, but you need this repaired as well. And every time someone from the roofing company needed uh, or um, gave a referral, they of course gave this girl's boyfriend's the referral, Blue. So, you know, you use surveillance in domestic cases. Um, you can learn a lot from surveillance. You know, you give me time watching you without you knowing it, I'm going to learn a lot about you. Things that you probably haven't even told your friends or don't want to tell your friends. Um, you know, I've sat on people and I've followed them to um, the mall where they pulled into the parking lot, waited for another person to arrive. Both of them switched cars. Then they go off to a motel somewhere. Uh, I've seen people come out and start dealing drugs on the street corner. I've seen a guy come out of his house, sit on his porch and start emptying out a, a cigar wrapper and you know stuffing it with marijuana and then sitting there on the porch and smoking it. Uh, you know, and I'm filming the whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm literally, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet from the guy. Um, the way I approach surveillance is, I believe that you enter a neighborhood and you leave a neighborhood without anyone knowing you were there. You can't roll into a neighborhood at 7 o'clock in the morning, sit in the front seat, stop, hang your hand outside the driver's side window and start watching your guy's house from your seat like this. Okay? The guy's house who you parked in front of, who got up in the morning, has his cup of coffee and his bowl of cereal and is watching out his window, sees you pull up, and then you just sit. He's going to be like, what's this guy doing? He's going to give you a little while. Pretty soon he's going to walk out there and try to figure out what you're doing. Um, I know I had told you the story about when I had first started. I was in my, what? What kind of car did I have? Chiraco. VW Chiraco. Yeah, and I was all rolled back in my seat, in my front seat. I had my big lens. Okay. Well, I was 22 years old at the time. I've learned a lot over the years. You know, um, Seriously, a lot of time has passed since those days. Those days are long gone from me. I might sit like that at a distance when I know the case really well. And I just know the pattern of behavior, which is something that we're all a student of. Once I see him coming out a certain way, then I might follow him. But if I'm in a new surveillance situation, I am set up outside of the perfect person's house, off to the peripheral, either left or right, 
could be as much as a block away. But I have constant maintenance, main, maintenance of what? Door and car. Yeah. The door or that car. Most of the time it's the front door. I gotta be able to see the door, you know? At the same time, I don't want him looking out and being able to see me out of any window. Now granted, there could be a side window they could be looking at and they could see you. But if you're rolling up or rolling into a neighborhood like you should, starting at 6 a.m., be in there at 6 a.m. You know, I, I always get worried, and you heard me say this before, when I'm on the road at 6 a.m. and I'm driving and I'm seeing cars. You don't see a lot, but you see cars. And you're, it's constantly going through your head, that could be my guy. He could have gotten up already. And it's very aggravating, you know, you're... Your uh, tensions are very high early in the morning. You want to get there. You're hoping that no one left. You're hoping that you're getting there before he has awakened. You roll into the neighborhood. You roll past his house one time. You only pass by a person's house one time in the morning. Make your notations. What cars are in the driveway. Get your car off, you know, about a half a block away or a block away if you can. Make sure that you have a good line of sight on that front door. Or if worst case scenario, that car parked in the driveway. You're certainly going to see anyone coming or going to the house. Because you're going to see the driveway and the roadway. Once your car is parked off uh, to the peripheral or off to the uh, left or right of the house, you're going to make sure that you're car is faced in the opposite direction of the subject's house, okay? People might tell you differently, you know, you might read a book that tells you to do it a certain way. You might go to work for a client that tells you, or a company that tells you he wants surveillance done this way. Well, you know, chances are you're going to have to do it the way he's asking you to do it. I'm just telling you that from my experience, things that have been most productive for me is to park with my vehicle in reverse. Okay. Now that makes following the person more difficult. If he comes out and goes in the opposite direction, you have to turn your car around. You might only have a few seconds to do that. And if you can't do it quickly, then you might not be able to park with your car in reverse. You might have to adapt. You know, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I had a case in Newark, New Jersey. Did I tell you this story already? Have I told any stories while you guys have been here? <laughs> One or two. I was in Newark, New Jersey. Well, I had a case in Newark, New Jersey, and I farmed the case out to a buddy of mine. Um, he's a good investigator. He was a detective and stuff, retired, but he hadn't really done PI work. And, uh, and you know, PI work isn't necessarily like police work. They're, it's kind of different, you know. PI work is kind of the guy that's kind of an entrepreneurial type of person, small businessman, wants to get in there, try stuff, not afraid to take some risk. You know, some law enforcement guys, when they've gone through their, uh, when they've been through um, their career, you know, they've done everything above level. They don't want to do anything in the gray area. They don't want to do something wrong. That could affect their career. So they're used to following the straight and narrow. This is different. PI, working in the gray area, in the shadows, you know, police officer, straight and narrow. Could be a little bit of a conflict there. So anyway, I call him up. I say, I have the case in Newark. And he, li he lives in, um, uh, right outside of Newark in I want to say Bay Bayou, Bayonne, Bayonne, New Jersey. And um, so he goes over there and he sits, he gets there in the morning, he sits till 2, 3 o'clock, no movement. Comes the next day, same thing, no movement. He sends me a report, you know, basically 20 hours worth of time, no activity. I said, Joe, you know, I can't give this to my client. I, I don't give my clients reports and say, I went, sat, saw nothing, here's your bill. I said, you know, that's like taking your car to the repair shop and the repairman saying, I'm the best repairman in all of Kissimmee. You bring your car in there because it stalls at red lights. He tears your motor apart. He rebuilds your engine. He does everything he can. He gives it back to you, drive it away, and it stalls at the red light. Same problem you had when you took it in there. And he gave you a bill for 800 bucks. You know, are you ever going to go back to that repairman again? You're probably not even going to want to pay the bill, but to get your car, you had to. Uh, in our business, you know, 
typically we got to send out bills, at least for the insurance industry, I got to send them a bill. They have 30, 60, or 90 days to pay. So, uh, so I send out something that's crap. They just send me back a little note and saying, you know, forget it. Well, we're not paying for this. This is terrible. Or they pay me and they never call me again, which is worse. Because like I told you before, it's more expensive to find a new client than it is to keep an old client happy. Go out and do it again. Because even if you spend another $800 redoing that case, I guarantee you to find another client, it's gonna cost you more than $800. Now I'm not talking just about some domestic person that hired you off the street. I'm talking about a business relationship you have. Somebody that's sending you, you know, $100,000 worth of business a year. But in the same respect, you should treat every client the same because that's how you're going to build a reputation for yourself. So I hire my buddy, drives over from Bayonne, New Jersey to Newark and uh, gets absolutely nothing. And uh, he says to me that there were Christmas lights on in the window. First he tells me that he doesn't think anybody's home. But then when I talk to him, he tells me a couple things. It was Christmas lights, Christmas tree on. Well, people don't go away with Christmas lights and Christmas trees on. He also told me that he went up and knocked on the door and a dog was barking. He verified that no one was home. You know, this was a single woman, lived alone in Newark. Okay, they don't always answer the door. Especially if they have a, a, uh, an ongoing lawsuit with a personal injury. They might just say, no, I'm not going to the door. So uh, I call my dad, <clears throat> my dad lives in Philly, and uh, I said, Dad, I want to come up and visit you. So I had something going on, maybe a family reunion, it was around, or a, uh, um, well, I, it might have been around Thanksgiving, I think I had a um, high school reunion. So I was going to tie the two together, hey, fly up, go to my high school reunion, work a case. So uh, I tell my dad, I said, listen, pick me up in Newark. It's a little further, but he gets the same drive, I guess, from Philly Airport for him to Newark Airport. And I said, we're going to do a case. And he's like, he's all excited. <laughs> 83 years old. <laughs> and uh, he's in his, he shows up, and my dad always drives a big car. And I never know what it's going to be. And it's usually really old. Like, it could be a 1998 he bought it for 600 bucks. He lives in a retirement home, so sometimes people pass away and he buys their car or whatever. So it has like 30,000 miles on it. It's a 98 Cadillac. So he shows up in like a Lincoln Continental. And uh, so he picks me up and I was like, wow, really nice, Dad. He goes, yep. Bought it for $1,200. How many miles on it? 46,000. <laughs> he goes, you know, the old man down the hall, Paul uh, died and his wife doesn't drive. So, so, I mean, he could buy and sell cars because he has that many. Then he'll turn around and he'll sell it, his old one, for like twice what he paid for it. So, uh, he picks me up and we drive over there. And uh, he picks me up at like 2 o'clock. And by the time we get there, it's like 3.34. And as we're pulling in, the woman's coming out of the house, coming out of her apartment, and he, we're on this street, and um, I go, Dad, that's her. Turn it around. <laughs> <laughs> took him like 10 minutes to turn the car around. I should have just gotten out of the car and followed her on foot. <laughs> By the time he turned that car around, I think she was in Florida. <laughs> but she was just like out of sight. And I was looking at him like, going, come on, come on. And you don't want to yell at him, you know, because he's doing the best he can. He did like his eight point turn. <laughs> Finally got that thing around and we were like, I was like, dad, you know, get out of here and make it right. Let's Let's see if she's there. We're looking. Uh, she's like, could make a left, Dad. Let's just go down this way. No, she's not there. I said, okay, let's, you know, let's go the other way. We'll check that out. And I said, oh, what's that? And it was like stairwell or stairway, and then they had the overhead train. 
I said, I bet she walked around the corner there, went up that thing, got on the train, and left. So that night I got a hotel room, and I told my dad, I said, you know, can I borrow your car? Let me just take your car. And I said, I'm probably not going to follow her in it. I'm just, just going to get there, and I'm going to get out on foot just like she is. Okay. When you're in a, an environment like that, you have to adapt to the environment. You're not going to go to Manhattan and have a car and do surveillance with a car. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, chances are the other person is not going to have a car. The second chances are is that you're not going to find a parking space to even be able to sit to watch the person. And they're going to walk faster than you drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're going to. Yeah, and they're going to go places where you can't even drive. Um, now, if you're in uh, you know, Queens or you're outside the city, it's something different. But you have to adapt. You know, uh, on the test it says being on foot is better in a, a you know in a uh, heavily traffic area like in a city environment. So I got there. I get out of the car, across the street from her house, like a little park. Just hung out in the park. Sure enough, about four thirty. Something like that. I don't remember the exact time, so don't hold me to it. She comes out of the house. Boom, I follow her. She goes around the corner. She goes up that rail, and she gets on the train. I follow her into town. She's working nights. It's around Christmas time. She's picked up hours at a local mall, working in a, uh, a little gift shop. So, you know, she didn't want anybody to know what she was doing. My buddy, who's so caught up in doing our surveillance from 6 to 3 or 6 to 2, your 8-hour shifts... Instead of maybe staggering his shifts, I always tell my guys, if I give you a case, you go sit and stay and don't move until you see the subject. That's all there is to it. I don't care if the client said do two four-hour days. I don't care if they said do two eight-hour days. Well, the way I see that is, is that you have eight hours, you have 16 hours if you add the time together. I know I have that authorization. I'll worry about the client. You just deliver me the product, okay? And what we need to deliver is a running car, a car that doesn't stall at an intersection. We need to deliver videotape of the subject doing something. That's our job. We need to deliver proof that the guy is working when he says that he can't work to pay his child support. We need to show, um, what was the other one? Can't pay child support? Or we need to prove that the guy's unfit to have custody of his child. Mm -hmm. You know, if anybody asks you, you know, are you biased to one side or the other, people will say, "Oh, no, no, no. We're investigators. We report the facts and only the facts." Well, that's what Sergeant Friday does. <laughs> that's not what a PI does. If O.J. Simpson didn't pay his private investigator two hundred and fifty dollars an hour to report the facts and only the facts. You think he brought back a stack of facts and said, here you go, OJ, I found out that you're guilty. I found all these facts that kind of prove you're guilty. No, his PI went out there to find a way to build a defense for him. You know, if you don't understand that, you're in the wrong business. You're not going to make any money. You can't produce evidence that's going to conflict with what your client wants. You can't manufacture evidence either. You can't go out there and throw quarters on the ground so that the guy comes out and says, oh, quarter, quarter, and he starts picking them up and you get them bending. Or you can't go out there and flatten his tire so he comes out and goes, oh, shit, I got a flat tire. And he goes out there, jacks it up, takes the tire off. I mean, if my guys have a flat tire, I, I'll film it, but I, it bothers me. Because people are going to think that I did that. You know? That's the first thing I think of. Shoot. That's one of the questions I was going to ask you yesterday. I'm like, great, he got a flat tire. They're going to think I flattened his tire. So, um, so, so I don't know where all that was going. But, um, you really don't throw quarters down for him? No, I don't throw quarters down. I don't do any of that stuff. Some people put like cinder blocks behind their car. The guy comes out and he's like, what the heck is this a prank? You know, some kids did this. Um, no, don't do that kind of stuff, you know. But I understand that my goal, you know, it's much, it's a lot harder when you do everything legit. You got to try to really get something on the person that you know is going to be valuable to your client. And uh, will you get the, you know, the smoking gun every single time? No. 
But you know what? The gun will be warm. It'll be hot. You'll know that it's been fired. I mean, that's our that's our job is to get that. Um, so, and you have to hold yourself to that standard. Don't let yourself don't let yourself say, "Well, you know, it's just one of those things where it's not there to get." Don't let yourself off the hook like that. You know, I don't know what you guys do in your in your professional lives, but. Mm -hmm. Everything, you know, you always want to be the guy who's doing it to the best of your ability. You want people to, to know that you're not, you know, a slacker, or that you're not just a waste of space. You know, you have to be the same way in this industry. So. Go above and beyond. Yeah, go above and beyond and really understand that there's people out there that, um, that will if you don't. And they're going to be the ones that are, that are the busiest. You know, I didn't, I wasn't able to stay in this business for 30 years because I operated a fly-by-night operation. I was able to stay uh, in the industry because, you know, I always take everything very serious um, about each and every case I get. Now, let's go back, let's forget the Newark case, let's go back to a regular surveillance. I get there early in the morning, I'm parked in the back, I'm parked with the back of my car facing my subject's house. I'm literally in the back seat of my car or my truck. If you've seen my truck, I have a, a Explorer. I used to have an Expedition, which I loved, but it cost me about $200 every other day I was filling up. So I went to an Explorer, which I hate, sorry, because you can't even put a sheet of plywood into the back room. You'd think they'd make them just a little bit bigger, so you get a sheet of plywood in there, but they don't. So I have the seats out of the back of my car, and I have like a, uh, a lawn chair, a plastic lawn chair with a nice cushion because you spend a lot of time on your butt. It's got to be a thick cushion, a good cushion. My cushion is a marine cushion. It's used to being wet, and uh, so it's really good and solid and I have it kind of like taped to the chair and I have the chair cut down I have the legs cut off of the chair so it sits down because you can't get a full-size chair in the back of your truck if you notice you have basically about this much space so you have to sit down lower so I'm sitting there I'm in my car and uh, I'm facing out the back now as soon as I get there I'm gonna start setting up my equipment it's six o'clock in the morning but I'm getting ready I'm going to set up my camera on a tripod. My tripod is going to be aimed at my subject's house. I'm going to be sitting there. I'm going to be waiting for the first movement. As soon as I see something, I'm going to hit record. I'm going to start recording that person from the time they come out of their house. When I'm first sitting there, I'm going to see the bedroom light go on in that house. I'm going to see the hall light go on in that house. I'm going to see the kitchen light. Smell the coffee. I'm going to smell the coffee. I'm going to know everything that's going on in that house. That's the way I want it. I'm not rolling up at 9 o'clock going, hmm, no cars in the driveway. Now, do they not have any cars? Uh, well, there's a garage. Are they in the garage? You know, who wants to go through that? You know, I don't have like a, a um, crystal ball. Yeah, a crystal ball to be able to tell what transpired prior to me getting there. I'm going to get there early. I'm going to get there so that I don't have to go through all that guessing game. I'm going to see two cars parked in the driveway, a truck and a car. And I know my subject is a 40-year-old guy that used to do construction work. Chances are the truck's his. I get there in the morning, I see the wife leave, 7.30 in the morning, she comes out, she goes down the road. 10 o'clock, my guy comes out, boom, I'm filming him. He backs out, comes my way, I make sure I lay low. He goes by me, makes a left, I just wait until he makes that left, and then boom, I come right up. Shoot up to that intersection. Kind of peek around the corner a bit, a little bit, because if he stopped, I don't really want to necessarily pull right around behind him. You know, we're in his neighborhood still. Let's get out of that neighborhood, then I'll kind of get a little closer. I pull up a little bit. He makes a right. I race up, do the same thing on the next corner, kind of watch. I see that that's leading out to the main road. I say, as soon as I see him pull out, I pull right up. 
Now, I got to make it through that intersection. I, I can't dilly dally around. I might have to pull out in some heavy traffic. You know, some cars might, you know, squeal their tires. <laughs> Stop it. But I got to get out there because every second is crucial. Most of the time, you will lose your person within the first couple of minutes of following him. Because getting out of that neighborhood is the most critical part. Once you're behind him, you're fine. Once you're behind him, you know, it's like, you know, white on rice. You're right there. Okay? You don't know what kind of car was behind you today. You don't know what kind of car was behind you today. Neither do you and neither do you. Okay? And you're all in this class. You all think that you're private investigators. You're all getting in this industry. But you're not as observant as you think you are. You're only observant when you want to be. Okay? I have no idea if somebody followed me here today or if anybody was behind me today. Now, hopefully there's no reason for anybody to be following me. You, that's another case, Dirty Harry. You know, with a name like Dirty Harry, you never know. You could be followed any time. Plus with your former history, you know. Being from New York and all. I mean, all that, a lot of that stuff that's going on in New York. You know what I mean, right? What? I don't know. Just I don't know. see if I can get it out of you. you Remember know. those things that you did and you weren't supposed to be doing? Play <laughs> the fifth. <laughs> so, um, once I'm out on that main road, I'm behind him. I'm not letting the car between us. Now, granted, in a perfect situation, you'll be in the right-hand lane while he's in the center lane. What happens when you're in the right-hand lane kind of right on his back tail there? Can he see you? No, there's a blind spot there where he really can't see you. Same thing can happen on his other side. You can kind of get in his blind side if you kind of stay back. But if you're in the far left-hand lane and there's three lanes and he's in the center lane and he moves to the right and makes a right-hand turn, you might be stuck not being able to get across. So you stay behind him or you stay in the right-hand lane. If he moves to the left, you have no other choice other than move to the middle lane or get behind him because he can make a left-hand turn. While you're driving, you're not relaxed. Trust me, you're not relaxed. You should be pumped up. You should be looking ahead. What's coming up? Where am I going? What direction am I headed? Is 75 coming up? Is I-4 coming up? Is 192 coming up? Um, is 92 coming up? Like, where am I going? Which, which direction am I headed? Um, you, have to, you have to anticipate all that. You gotta be ready. Now, do you want to be on his tail? No. If you can be back just a little bit, you know, sometimes people are driving and then it, it hits him at the last second that they want to get a cup of coffee at McDonald's. Like maybe they were thinking about going to Dunkin' Donuts and they drove by McDonald's and they saw it said free, you know, a cup of coffee or something with a small one. And he pulls in right away. Well, you have to be back just a little bit so that if he makes a move, you have a chance to react. If you're too close to him, he might go in. You might have to. You might find yourself needing to pass him. Bad move. Never pass your subject. Either follow him in to McDonald's and park immediately somewhere near the front so you can see him going out. Or right when he turns right, you turn left. When you turn left, you're parking in a business across the street from the McDonald's with a direct view of the McDonald's. Okay? You can't proceed it, you can't proceed forward and lose sight of your subject. You'll lose them. You will lose him. It's very, you know, it sounds silly, you know, that you can lose somebody, but in reality, it happens all the time. You make, you make these small mistakes that I'm telling you not to make, but you're going to make them, and you're going to lose people, and you're going to say, you know, he told me not to do that. Like, always keeping, never taking your eyes off of his car when you're following him. You know, I lost a motorhome pulling a boat. Okay? I was following behind him. I was in La La Land, you know? I've been, I have done over 50,000 surveillances, and I'm following behind him, and I don't know, I'm on vacation somewhere, or thinking about my vacation, or thinking about something else. And I'm driving, and next thing I know, I'm thinking to myself, who am I following? Where's, where's that motorhome? 
Like I just, you just, you ever drive somewhere and you don't remember driving or getting there because your mind is somewhere else? Okay. Well, that happened to me, and and you can't let it happen. You have to when you're following somebody, you have to be watching that car the whole time. I got a call about a month ago. A buddy of mine who's working in this area, who's not from around here, he's following a car from Point Siena. It's a, um, the car is a white, I think it's an American car. Um, and he's following the car, and they head out the back way, they go to 27. And at 27, the guy pulls into a gas station, and he goes forward, and then comes back, and he sees the guy going north on 27, so he starts to follow him. Went past him, took his eyes off of him. He says to me, he goes, John, I need some help. I'm not sure if this guy's skittish, if he's on to me, but it's a real big case. Where are you? What are you doing? And I said, I said, well, 27, I, I live over at, out in Celebration. I can get the 27, just going south on uh, I-4. I could probably be there in 15 minutes. He goes, can you come over? He says, I think the guy's going north up to Ocala Springs. They're in like bathing suits and he has a fishing pole. Like they're going somewhere for the day. He says, it's a big case. So I shoot over there and um, they're at this new, he says, right now they're at a dollar store in this new mall that's near 27 and I-4. So uh, so I shoot over there and I pull in and he goes, and they're in the white, you know, I don't know, Pontiac Le Mans. So I pull in and I go to the dollar store and I see the white car and I'm like, that's an ES350 Lexus. Right, so I drive over to him, I said, where is he? He goes, he's right over there in that white car. I said, I thought you said it's a Pontiac. He goes, yeah, Pontiac, tag number. I said, that's a Lexus. That little turnaround that he did on 27 where the guy pulled over for a second and he went up, he saw another white car go. He came after that white car. Oh, you know, wow. he's about a quarter of a mile behind him. He sees it's white, but he doesn't know the make or the model. And it pulls in. He's trying to stay off of him because he doesn't know if that little pull-off move was like the guy trying to lose him. He was following the wrong car for like five, six miles. And, uh, you know... What's the best way to avoid that? Just get the plate number. You can never take your eyes off the car. Okay? I was working a case in Naples. Okay? The guy was driving, the guy drove a CLK, I think it's 530 Mercedes SUV. Okay? I was sitting outside of his complex. His complex was gated. I don't know if it's the guy with the prosthesis missing the right leg. I don't know if. I talked about mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I? Yeah. Oh, what, one of the videos? John no, I think he told us. No, story. not that guy, not the golfing guy. So anyway, um, they tell me that he lost a leg, he doesn't ever move. I waited around, finally got him shopping. Um, just at the grocery store, but it was significant because it showed him out using his prosthesis that he says he, you know, he's not comfortable with and he drove his car. I sat in front of that complex. I counted 25... Mercedes ESK 500s. You know, at any time I was following them. Look, no, not my guy, wrong tag. Following them, it was like a full time job yeah. just following these white Lexuses coming out of this subdivision because everybody had them. You know, it's, it's not uncommon, man. There's a lot of cars that look similar. So, you know, you're on a white car, another white car comes, it's similar, it's up ahead of you, you're following it. That's why you can't lose sight of it. You got to stay on that car all the time. So now I'm following my guy, right? I'm on my surveillance, I'm following him, I'm behind him. I'm trying to figure out where he's going. I'm watching the lights. Lights are crucial. He comes up, light turns yellow, he starts to slow down, and then boom, he goes through it. You start to slow down because it's a chain reaction. You're slowing down a few seconds behind him. He goes, he makes it, you go to go, and you see two flashes of light. Your tag's being getting the picture taken, and you're going to get a $150 
Yeah. yeah, president in the mail. Okay, that's gonna ruin your day. So when the light comes, you got to be up next to him. You got to be right on his tail. If he breaks, you're breaking. You got one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake. You're like, let's go, let's go. Are we gonna stop? Are we gonna go? What are we gonna do? You know. And if he goes, you're, you know, it's almost like he's pulling you through there. And uh, and that's nerve wracking. You know, you don't turn into a guy like me. You know, having done this for 30 years without being on edge while you're working these cases. Um, I had a case the other day where my, you know, my tape didn't work and I got sick to my stomach. That's how wrapped up I was in this case. Um, and if you're not like that, I would, I would wish that you don't even get into this industry. Because there's lots of people that don't take it as serious as I do, that they're in it, and they do a really bad job and they give us a really bad name. So, I'm following my guy, I'm watching the lights. Lights are, you know, lights are a big deal. Another problem is going out of a, a residential area, you know, or a, you're in a school zone, and all of a sudden he goes and the lady stops out and goes, you know, lets the kids out. You got to anticipate that too, you know. Uh, you're going through a school zone, you're like right on his tail. Like, and if they want to say stop, but they can't because you're too close <laughs> to them, you know. You can't let them do something to you like that. So now, my guy's just going to the convenience store because he just ran out of cigarettes. He's not working, he's injured. So he pulls into the convenience store. What do I do? Pull behind him. Okay. I gotta pull, of course I gotta be right behind him. Mm -hmm. Or I gotta be across the street. But I gotta be, whatever he does, if he pulls into the convenience store, if I'm gonna go in, I usually pull right up to the pump. I pull up past a little bit so that I can turn around in my seat and shoot back through the back of my car, which is all tinted, which he's not going to see me, and I'm going to start filming him as he's getting out of the car. Okay? So I got to be quick. When I'm following him, I have my camera on my lap. When I see him pull into the convenience door, I flick my camera on. By the time he stops, I'm stopped. My camera's up. I'm focused on him, I'm hitting record. It has to happen that quick. If you don't get that film, okay, you're new, you just started, you don't know how to handle your camera quite yet, um, you're lazy, you just doesn't really matter to you whether you get it or not. Um, and, and those are the things that, you know, I would look for if I gave you a case. I would want to see that you were like really pumped up and motivated and prepared and, we're going to do the best job possible. You feel him getting out of the car. How he gets out of the car is important. How he moves. How he comes back and gets into the car. A guy with a sore back doesn't come into the car and go plop in the driver's seat. He usually sits down very slowly and then he moves one leg in and then he moves the other leg in behind the, steer, behind the uh, driver's seat. So I want to get that film of him going in. I then want to film him at the register, walking out, coming out the door, getting back in his car, closing the door, and then as he goes back to the house, I'm going to lay off of him a little bit. You know, I don't want to risk this case. I don't want to risk like getting too close to him while I'm following him back to his house. It's not that important of activity. Now, if he came outside and started digging a ditch, then I'm going to get close. I might get in a more risky position because I know that the evidence is going to be more valuable. But nonetheless, I still treat all evidence the same in thinking that I got to get it. You know, from the convenience store to whatever he might be doing at the house. If he's out and in view, I know I need to secure that evidence. Let's pause the tape. That button? Yeah. It's on. This is a continuation of the uh, surveillance um, lecture. So, you know, we talked about setting up in our surveillance, being in our car, how our car was located. Now, I didn't, I didn't really take you back what goes into the surveillance preparation prior to that. I mean, at some point, you have to understand what environment that you're going into initially. 
um, back in the day before there was Google Map uh, and uh, you know 360 ground view and all that other stuff that you have it was more difficult to try to figure out you would look at a map and you'd want to try to figure out where the guy lived and what roads went to what main roads like how he would travel out of the area today I always Google Map my house the house so I immediately know what it looks like Sometimes I can even see cars parked in the driveway. Do you do Google Street View? Yeah, Street View. Yeah. Thank you. If it's available, I'll do yeah. the Street View. If it's not, I'll hover over the top of it. What, what, the best image I can get. I'll know, you know, it's three houses down. I'll know that maybe I can't see the house from the street. It sits back off. Um, when I'm in a situation like that, I could say, you know, this might be a stationary surveillance position meaning although I travel all the time with my camo gear in the back of my car I might really prepare for a stationary wood line position in other words I might double check that I have my clippers for making for cutting branches uh, make sure I have my bug spray make sure I have my net you know sometimes especially around this time of year uh, my camo stuff gets ransacked by the kids that want to use my stuff for Halloween. You know, they'll wear my hat and my camo stuff and everything. So I got to make sure it's all there. Or if my, if my wife washed something, I got to make sure it's back in my pack. But um, so a decision has to be made. Is it going to be stationary or mobile? Mobile is in your car, parked down the street, ready to follow them. Traditional neighborhood type of surveillance. Not the type of surveillance you're going to be doing at Ocala National Forest or even some places down where you live. You live in uh, Polk County, Lakeland, Bartow area. You can have some rural locations, um, rural home sites where typically you'll get two days of surveillance on a subject. If you really want to find out what the subject's up to, what his activities are, I have, at this point in my career, I demand three days worth of time on all my cases. So I, I pretty much tell my clients, if they say they want one or two days, I say, well, you know, I have a three-day minimum. And I try to push that and stick to it. Now, if I'm hungry for business, that's not something you say to your clients. But I had the opportunity when my client asked me, what are your, you know, requirements? What, what is this? I want to prepare it and pass it around the office. I kind of set that up in advance. And I know with three days, I can usually get what it is I need to get. In a case where it might be a very rural neighborhood, I might spend my first day solely in a wood line position in a, or in a hedge or in some place where I'm just sitting for the whole day. I have no, um, there's no anticipation that I'm gonna like follow the person. I'm not gonna jump out of the hedge and start running down the street to my car. Or I'm not gonna jump out of the wood line. That's gonna spoil the whole case. That day is for purely reconnaissance, just sitting on the house, observing everything that's happening. Um, in Boca Raton, uh, Boca Yacht and uh, Tennis Club. Couldn't get in, couldn't get in, decided to go over the wall early in the morning. This is just facetious what I'm saying on this tape, so if uh, anybody you know feels that I'm being serious, I'm not, so I'm just giving this as just an example, hypothetical example. Um, so I go over the wall, it's like 5 o'clock in the morning and I'm walking down the street and I'm in full camo gear. Okay, I got my backpack on which has my little three-legged chair in it, stool for sitting on, I have a um, tripod camera mounted on top, it's in my bag, everything's in my bag, I'm walking down the street, it's dark. My subject's house is right there, <clears throat> about from a little closer than that house right over there, that greenhouse, that house would probably move that over about, I don't know, 10, 15 yards. I'm walking down the street and I just fall into a hedge. Nice hedge, very nicely trimmed, and, uh, and of course, um, hypothetically speaking, uh, things that you shouldn't do, you know, I begin to cut a little space inside that hedge with my clippers. 
so that I could make it a little more comfortable for myself. And I set up my tripod, and I'm on my house. Now, um, my objective on this day was I had no idea what cars my subject drove because both cars might have been leased or maybe in a company's name. Whatever they were, they weren't coming up in my database. I had no way to find out what kind of car she drove. And if I don't know what kind of car she drives, I can't pick her up outside her neighborhood when she leaves. I won't know who's who. So I had to get inside and I had to wait there until that garage door opened. And at about 11, 12 o'clock, that garage door opened and boom, there's two cars. Me, my camera's running, I'm filming it the whole time. Making sure I get each car, what type they are, the plate, and I can remember them and I can look at that tape later and pick out every little characteristic about that car because, or those two cars. Because the next day I'm gonna be outside in my car and when she leaves in one of those vehicles, I wanna be prepared to follow her. But I gotta make sure that I remember them, I study them carefully. Now on this day, she leaves, but I stay. Because I've already committed to staying there all day. She comes back, she opens the garage door remotely, pulls in, gets out, opens up the trunk, starts pulling groceries out of the back. You know, carries them inside, comes back out, carries them. I'm right there, I'm filming this, I'm filming everything that I need. And it's the best quality because I'm in a stationary position, I got my camera on a tripod. It's like you're watching, you know, uh, a movie. It's perfect. And, and of course, that's, that's what, we, uh, what we want. So making a decision on whether it's going to be mobile or um, stationary is something that has to be done up front because there's preparation involved in a stationary position. Now I will also um, Google my, my subject's name and I will Facebook them to see if I can find out some additional information. Uh, by through Google and uh, Facebook, uh, I might be able to get a picture of someone. And, uh, and of course that helps. I had one time an older woman that lived in an apartment or in a uh, mobile home complex. Listen to this. Gated mobile home complex. You don't find a lot of those. Mm -mm. But some in Davenport. They have bunch. <laughs> they have. Oh, is there? Oh, Morton Beach. Try serving. Morton Beach has one. Oh, you, do you serve process? Uh -huh. Oh, you do? I do bank work. Oh, you do bank work? Bank Are you a bank. process server? No? So you serve um, so I mean subpoenas? Sheriff. No, I meet with the sheriff. We have to remove it from the property, change oh. the locks, oh, okay. lock it down. I do full basic home repossession. Oh, okay, nice. So you know about good, inexpensive property in your area? That lists that aren't even in... Has to be listed? Huh? Uh, well, I have listings that haven't made it to the listings yet. Oh, you I'm do? I'm the first one to take it. Are you the, uh, are I you a realtor? Fire, no, I hire and fire them. Oh, you do? For what bank? All of them. A lot of them in Polk County? It's a, what do you there's mean There's some there. It's not as bad. I work at Wells Fargo Bank of America. You name the bank. And you work for a company? Myself. Oh, okay. How'd you get into that line of business? Sold a guy a dog. Oh, yeah? What kind of dog? Don't say a pit bull. Mm -hmm. oh, I raised Michonne. Born and raised Florida boy. <laughs> yeah. Polk County boy. Raising pit bulls. Now, don't tell me you fight dogs. Oh, no. Okay. I do that. I train in police work. Though. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, so you're like a regular board. entrepreneur. For as young as you are, have you ever worked for anybody? When's the last time you worked for somebody? Other than myself? When I was 14. Wow. 15. Worked for checkers for two weeks, got fired, that was that. Oh, yeah. yeah it didn't go over well. <laughs> Guy threw a soda in the window and I threw one back. And... Uh, they don't let you do that kind of stuff? No, no. He got a Sprite instead of a Coke or whatever it was. And came in the window. Well, the other day when I was in Lake Wales and I drove through McDonald's, I asked for a um, you know, 
one of those meals, and I said, a medium coffee, two sugars. So I get up there, and it's a small coffee with cream. <laughs> so I go inside, and I tell the manager, you know, the guy that's like six months older than the other 15-year-old kid uh -huh. that was at the window, <laughs> and I said, listen, I asked for a medium coffee with two sugars, no cream. So he comes back with a medium coffee. I open it. It's got cream in it. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, said, I said, I don't want any cream, two sugars. So he took that cup, and he disappeared out of my view, and he came back with my coffee. Later that day, I had that mishap with my camera, but at the same time, I had been feeling sick almost all day. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh -oh. So... I think that even the guy might have put like some detergent in my <coughs> coffee or something. Don't dish soap. Yeah. Is that what it is? Visine oh. used to be the thing. Visine, all that. They changed the formula on that. It doesn't work. Oh, too did well. they? Yeah. Because of that. That was the bartender trick yep. there. If you had a bartender, she'd squirt visine in your cup. Yep. My sister's bartender. And, you have to go up to and yeah. what happens? Oh, Just, you get the crap for yeah. days. <laughs> Suddenly. Like, really? Horrible, yeah. horrible, horrible, horrible. Oh That's that thing for the eyes. probably turn nothing on. And your eyes are red? <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I never heard of that one. Oh. Any bartender knows that. Yeah. That was the uh, last call you were right here. Okay, we can't speak uh, this person's name, and this person's off the screen. But um, this is my investigative report of surveillance that I did. And um, like I'm saying, she lived in a. Um, a gated mobile home like they got something that you're going to steal we can hook up their trailer and pull it away <laughs> um you know but it was in like the fort myers area you know and, mm. and it was an older um it was an older place here was my target poor woman about 80 year old woman i had to follow around now you know you can you can say well geez um what are you gonna get on an 80 year old lady. Well, you know what? I'm gonna get everything I possibly can get. I'm gonna follow this lady. Here's her Facebook picture, by the way. She looks pretty good. But there she is on Facebook. Um, here's her mobile home and uh, her little cart that she drives around in and her car. Well, eventually, you know, she came out. She did a little gardening out in front of her house. And then she went out to dinner with the girls. Yeah, they went out. They're toasting. Well, the reason why they're toasting is because um, it was my girl's birthday. Uh, I got the case, and the first thing I always look at is when's their birthday. Because if I have three days and your birthday's coming up in a week, I'll probably wait for that week. So I told my client, I said, you know what? This woman's birthday is coming up. I'll go ahead and save my last day. Chances are she's going to go out. She's going to go do something. So I followed her out with the girls. And uh, yeah, she uses a cane. There's her cane. Um, carrying her to-go to box. But, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that... Um, when we're working these cases, we're always working for the defense. You're trying to get anything you can. Let's say I don't get anything on this woman and come court date, she comes wobbling in with her cane looking like, like she could barely get out of bed or she could barely walk. Whereas we might be able to take clips of this, like they might do a blow up picture of her there, you know, cheer, you know having a cheer of restaurant, and they just sit it in front of the jury just to let them look at that. And they're looking at that and they're looking at her <laughs> And they're thinking, well, look, she's out at the restaurant. They're doing cheers and everything. She, she doesn't look all that sad or depressed. And look, the date on it's just like two weeks ago. And they look at her over there. She's like, yes. Her head down. Like she can barely move. I mean, if she's asking for $5 million and the jury decides to award her a million, was my $1,000 or $2,000 surveillance worthwhile? Yeah, saved a lot of money. And uh, so you always have to look at it like that. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to get anything on this lady. She's 80. No, you get whatever you can. People all have to go shopping. 
she used that little cart there because Walmart was close by and they would like cut through some problems. Now I never caught her doing it. I wish I would have, but every, I saw a lot of other people going out through the gate and over to Walmart and then back again. I would have loved to have gotten that. Um, so I have to be very optimistic in what I'm going to get. Um, to go back to what I was, where I left off, the Facebook, you saw that I used um, Facebook to try to get a personal picture of her, which would be helpful. I'm also planning my surveillance. Is it going to be stationary or is it going to be mobile? You know, am I going to need specialized equipment? Am I going to want to have uh, some sort of specialized equipment? Now, when, when I first started in this business, what did John start with? It's a question on the test. 16 millimeter camera. Yep. And a clay tablet. Close. Motion picture. Clay. 16 millimeter motion picture film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know camera, but I like that motion picture film. <laughs> I started with 16 millimeter motion picture film. We didn't have video, you know, back then. Um, matter of fact, when I was in high school, color TV just came out. Remember? Yeah. When you grew up, you didn't have color TV. That's right. You and I are the same age, 42. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so when I started, 16 millimeter motion picture, and then we went to what? <coughs> VHS. Reel to reel. Reel to reel. That's right. Reel to reel VHS. The very first video that came out was reel to reel. You were pre reel to reel. Yeah. It was real? I was pre video. Reel to reel. Wire. Small camera that shot about six feet. The wow. lenses were not very good. Um, and then after that, we went to the big VHS. Everybody had those. Handle on the top. Do you remember those? Or are you too young see it on TV. <laughs> After that, they went to VHS C, the little fat ones. Mm -hmm. Then after that, they went to high eight. nine millimeter. They went to those eight millimeter, yeah. and then they went to high eight. Then they went mini to DV. then they went to digital yeah. eight. Then they went to mini DV. Well, you know, in a uh, In a covert situation, you know, I would have to get, this is a wireless AV receiver. I might have this in my car, and I would have the video out into a recorder, like a full-size VHS recorder in my car. Now I'm going to be inside. I'm going to have a transmitter on me. Think about all this junk we used to have. And remember, there's a lots of detective agencies that never even came close to having this stuff. We were a really large, we were the largest detective agency in the country. And now I think we're probably either one or two. Um, only because we weren't all about just hiring people. Like some of the, one of the biggest companies Every single person who works for them isn't necessarily a full-time employee. We were a, you know, we had only full-time staff uh, on ours. And we had the ability to, you know, to get the, any equipment that we really needed or wanted. Whatever was out there, we, we purchased it. Uh, wireless transmitter. Now this transmitter's going to be hooked up to something that everybody had back then. A beeper. Beeper. Now you can hook these two together in a fanny pack with some batteries. Clip that on the outside of your fanny pack or on a backpack. Put it on the back of your backpack. And then basically what you're doing is you're sending the signal out <coughs> to the receiver. If you got too far away from the receiver though, you're going to lose the signal. Uh, sometimes if we were like inside a mall, a second guy would have this in a backpack and not be too far from you, try to stay within line of sight of you so that he could be watching on a little monitor through the recorder to make sure he's getting what it is you and you are maybe going up to the salesperson and trying to put your backpack on top of the table 
and right on the guy as he's doing whatever it is he's doing behind the counter. It could be in a deli, pizzeria, you're trying to get the pizza guy. Any situation, it could be an accountant who's doing taxes from his house on the side. So you, you have all this stuff, okay? A lot of things can go wrong when you're working like this. Uh, I, we even had a stationary camera that's in a, it's in a green tube that they use for telephone outside your house, telephone and cable. We'd stick it in the ground and had a camera in the side of it. We'd put it on your house and had a little motorcycle battery and I'd sit down the street and I'd watch on my camera, watch the house. If it was a real rural area, I could set the camera up across the street. Now every time the wind blew, my signal blew. You know, my picture would go like this, the wind blew. So, a lot of things to go wrong, okay? You got wires, you got batteries, everything's powered by a battery. Um, this is actually audio, video, and power. The, um, the camera's right there in the O. Let's have a look at that. Pass it around. It's right there in the O. Now that's a Sony chip camera. That's a Sony chip in there. That camera was um, $129 in the O of Motorola. Oh. Hmm. Huh. So it was $120 how long ago? There's another one. About 15 years ago. What they use now? Okay. They still use this? No, smart no. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then we got high tech. Okay. I got HDMI out. <laughs> Hard drive with a built-in monitor. That small. A pack of cigarettes. You're using that now. Little button. No, this is, we're still going back. Okay. Button camera. Take it off. Put it in your shirt. Put the button back on. Make sure your shirt has black buttons. <laughs> if you need different size buttons, we have different sizes. Oh my okay, gosh. we can put the different size buttons on there. If you want to put it in a piece of furniture and maybe move it into a room, we have a screw. You can put the screw on it. You can drill a hole in a piece of wood and put the screw on there and no one's going to know it's going to be a screw. Um, piece of equipment is about you know five six years old. I recently uh, wore this on a case um, involving a person that was um, a movie producer. I also wore it in Aruba on a case where a guy was uh, stashing money offshore. The most recent one where I used it on the movie producer uh, on the day that he uh, or she um, released their film, I went in with it on, came back outside, and I didn't have any video. From using it over the years, somewhere in this part of the adapter, there's a little bit of a short uh, again, you know, we cut down on most of our problems because all the battery, it's just one battery in this piece, but you still have these wires, you know, and these wires cause problems. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, now we're going to more high-tech stuff. Hard drive. Hard drive. Small SD card goes in there. Now I'm sure that there's better quality ones than these. These I think I bought for twelve dollars, twelve or maybe twenty-four dollars. And I actually bought three or four pairs, and I can't get any of them to work. <laughs> so you get what you pay for. Well, you want the internet? Yeah. I made bought in them China? directly from China, yeah, yeah, made in China. 
Um, because I refuse to pay two hundred dollars when I know that these things are being made in China very inexpensively, uh, and I'm going to send him an email and tell him, "Hey, every pair that you sent me, I haven't been able to get them to work." That I have. Camera. Okay. It's a camera. This is my baby. Show Harry picking his nose. <laughs> he missed out on that last time. Huh? He missed out on that one last time. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have the same thing. Yeah. Has that worked on your vehicle as well? Or is it just your camera? Uh, it holds my keys. So it doesn't have buttons, active buttons on it? It has active buttons to turn record, on. turn it on, and video. Does it open your car? Door? Now I got. I think I have a picture of a real uh, newcomer. So our whole, our whole process. No, wasn't uh, No, don't tell me. Like he's a functioning alcoholic. You know, you know, you're barely giving me enough for me. You know, if you could get that. If not, I was trying to get him. Um, yeah. I had it sitting yeah. here. Sure it must be over his head. <laughs> okay, well, you got to know the direction on the side. But I had uh, Harry, met, who met Sally. Yeah, I knew if you saw it there, you'd tell him. So I had to be really, really quick with putting it there. I saw you put it there. You saw me put it there? Yeah. You saw me put it there? Uh, Did you, there oh, there I got him. Oh. That's proof he was in the room. <laughs> Anybody ask, was he here? Good quality picture. I love the little thing. It usually doesn't let me down. It let me down just now, but... How much is that, Tom? It didn't let you down. It was the user. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, uh, again, I have about four of them in there that don't work. How much did you pay for that? Uh, about twelve dollars each. Plus the shipping and handling sometimes is like ten dollars mm -hmm. from uh, China, ten twelve dollars. So about twenty five bucks. Oh, wait, what? eBay? Yeah, eBay. You have to mention that you want the eight oh eight keychain number three. That's supposed to be the one that's most reliable. That's what I asked for. This one here has been working for eight months. I have four in there that. Uh, aren't working. If I had more time, I'd probably follow up on it, but I don't, unfortunately. Now, have you ever tried a higher price one to see if there was any difference? No, not yet. I will. Probably. Uh, and of course, uh, I also have uh, the clip on one, which is another good one. These are higher price. These are like thirty-five dollars. This one here, which is called the Swan Thumb Cam, this is a good one. I think uh, I don't know where it is. It's it might be outside of my car. <clears throat> this is good. It comes with a little clip which I like it because I can clip it right on the front of a shopping cart and kind of push it around behind the person the whole time. And uh, so that works really well for me. The other thing that I use is uh, the track stick. Did I tell you about the track stick already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We told you the whole story. You showed how you tracked the guy and he got lost. And one yeah, night I put this on oh, the, yeah, the guy that yeah. gave me a hard time. Yeah, that's right. This track stick does not require a cellular service contract. You can buy these for I think like two ninety nine. Sam's Club. The Sam's Club have them. Two hundred fifteen. Same Sam's one. Okay. okay. Great, great little tool. Now you got to get this back. You put it on, then you got to get it back, <laughs> and then you plug it in, and you figure out it'll it'll sync with Google Map, and it'll tell you where your subject's been, where he went. It works very well. I've had this one. Uh, I showed them um, on the computer. That I had, I had this one guy that was in my class. And he was just a ball buster. Everything I told him, he had already known. He knew everything. I told him, I said, you know, I ought to just 
Shut my mouth. How much is it in his hands? Yeah. I told him I ought to just close my mouth and let him teach the class. So, as kind of a joke, I put it on his truck. And uh, he was staying in a local hotel because he was like from uh, some, he was like from Tampa area. And uh, he came over and I put it in. I took it off his car and I put it in and I basically showed him that he had gotten lost. He was here four days in a row and he had gotten lost on the fourth day. <laughs> so, and he got all upset that I had tracked him. But it was kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of funny. You know, like I really care what he thought. Uh, but it added a little uh, levity or a little bit of fun to the whole situation. The guy who had been busting my butt the whole time, finally I got to get back at him a little bit. John, do you just stick that into your side of your computer and yes. it does it? Uh -huh. You don't have to have any special type of program or anything? This has the program in it. Okay. And when you plug it in, it downloads the program onto your computer. And it even has a little update. Every time there's an update for this, it'll update. So this is very good. USB's change the world. Mm -hmm. USB's change the world. Yeah, sure have. No CD, no Now surveillance vehicles. You know, my choice of surveillance vehicle is an SUV, one that sits up a little bit. Now, I spent 20 years doing surveillance in a car. You know, when I first started, I had a car, a VW Scirocco. Uh, a very low car, and it was fine for me. But as I got older, and started making more money, I liked being in the big SUVs, you know, it gave me a lot more space. Uh, I loved my Expedition. God, when that, you know, that Explorer, when that Explorer on uh, steroids came out, that was, that was a cool car. A lot of room in there. Um, but I had to cut back and now I'm in an Explorer. I even knew guys that had small S10 pickup trucks. Anything to get you up off the ground a little bit, it helps your vision. Uh, picture yourself pulling into a public parking lot and wanting to be able to be up to shoot some video of your subject getting out of his car three aisles over or three lanes over. So it's nice to be up a little bit. And there's so many SUVs on the road today that um, you know you could, you could be in a little car and have two SUVs pull up next to you and all of a sudden you can't see anything. You know, so being up there at least at the same height, you could see through their window, you could shoot through their window. Um, one of the questions on the test talks about the best type of vehicle to have for surveillance. When we first started, everybody wanted a van, like a white panel van. Mm -hmm. you know? But after a while, people started seeing white panel vans in their neighborhood and they were all like, hmm, what's that guy doing? Even if you had a sign on the side of it, if it sat there all day, and they weren't used to seeing it, they came over and started looking in it. So the answer is no, a white panel van is not the best vehicle for surveillance. The best vehicle for surveillance is one that blends in with the neighborhood, one that's earth tone, not a red Ferrari like Magnum used to drive. You know, he used to sit right outside the guy's gate. As soon as the person left, he'd spin his tires and he'd pull out. Like that would ever really happen, come on. So an earth tone car, a car that fits in. You know, if you're in a neighborhood, like SUVs fit in everywhere. Even even the van, even like a passenger van, the uh, caravan, Dodge caravans, those type of vans, they fit in very well too. And they're also comfortable to do surveillance in. And of course, any typical car that's an earth tone color. Not red or uh, you know, bright orange. And you don't want your rims to stick out. You don't want a pair of dice hanging from your rear view mirror. You don't want anything that somebody looks in the rear view mirror and sees your car and goes, wow, that's unique. You know, because then they're going to remember it. When we're following somebody, we never look in their rear or side view mirrors. If we do, and they're looking at it and our eyes meet, there's a chance that they might remember you. People's eyes meet, they tend to remember each other.
So, let me just uh, review real quickly. Prior to surveillance, you want to check out the area, know what environment you're, you're going to be going into. You want to be able to Google your person, Facebook them, get an idea. You'd also do maybe a, a, a database background check on the person that might disclose like property information. If I check, if you, if I know you live in an address and I've Googled it and everything, and I check that address and find out you don't own it, what does that tell me? Renter. Yeah, you're a renter. You probably rent it. The person who owns your property, what is he? Landlord. The person who owns your property is oh. your landlord, and what it, what could he maybe be in a courtroom setting? If I needed him, a witness. A witness. I need to make note of his name and his number. Um, you might not live there anymore. <clears throat> I might go out to that house and you're gone. Now it turns into a locate. Well, before I start going off on a tangent, thinking, okay, I gotta initiate a locate investigation. Well, wait, wait, maybe I'll call the landlord. You know, hey, you know where Dirty Harry moved? Oh yeah, Dirty Harry's wife got transferred. She's working Pine Hills now, and uh, Dirty Howie's living off Pine Hills Road. Matter of fact, I talked to him the other day. He's in the third house on the left from the corner of... <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Landlord. Um, so, from there, I do my uh, background database. I have to decide mobile, stationary. What type of position am I going to take? Once I decide what type of position I'm going to do, do I need any specialized equipment? Or you'd be like me, you just carry it all with you all the time. Once you get out there, one of the most crucial things that you will do in any case is the position you select. Okay, whether it's mobile or stationary, whichever it is, where you that position is going to be crucial. If you're in a rural area and you decide not to go stationary but to be mobile and you're parked off to the side of the road and there isn't any other cars parked there, that's going to be a problem. He's going to leave or a neighbor's going to leave. They're going to see your car parked there where nobody ever parks and they're going to immediately become suspicious. And in a rural area, people look out for each other. If they see something strange, you know, the police don't get to a rural area in a half, in a heartbeat. So the neighbors, and plus they live in those types of environments because they're resourceful and they know how to take care of themselves to begin with, they're out there looking for stuff. And if they don't like something, they're going to go figure out what's going on. They're not going to wait for help to come, like mm -hmm. in, a, in a, you know, in a suburban neighborhood. Housewife looks outside, she sees a strange car, she calls, not, you know, she calls the police to come check it out. Not in a rural neighborhood. They'll come over there, and they'll find out what you're doing, and if they don't like what you're doing, they're going to want you to leave. So, But the same applies in a suburban neighborhood. If I'm in a suburban neighborhood, and I'm in a nice neighborhood, I'm in your parents' neighborhood in Claremont, and there's no on-street parking, everybody's parked in the driveway, I can't sit on the street. I'm going to be the only car sitting on the street. But I got, a, I got that house or door thing in my head, right? That, I don't think I've said it on, uh, during a, on a tape, but the main principle of surveillance is, is that you always have the person's front door or his car in your view at all times. If you're following him, you have his car in view. If you're sitting surveillance, you have his front door in view. You got to see his front door. You got to know who's coming in and out of the house. Well. If I'm in a nice neighborhood and there's no on-street parking, what do I do? I have to sit back, kind of study the neighborhood. I gotta figure out, is there an empty house on this block? Is there a house where both of the people, I already saw them leave for work. I saw the kids walk to the school bus in the morning. I saw the woman leave and the husband leave. You know, I might go take that spot in the driveway. I'm not going to stay on the street. Um, typically, I find you know that spot immediately. I come into a neighborhood, 
I find the spot that I'm going to sit in. Um, you know, I pulled in, sat in a spot, and while I'm sitting there, the garage door opens and the guy's trying to back out, and he almost hits my car. <laughs> I'm like, oh, sorry. Uh, but, you know, those are the chances I'm going to take. I'll deal with that guy. That's not my target. I'm not really worried about him. I'll, I'll deal with it. You know, oh, yeah, sorry, you know. So, what are you doing here? Oh, I was waiting for somebody. Uh, I thought this house was empty. What do you mean you thought it was empty? Well, you know, your grass is kind of high. <laughs> 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 you know, looks kind of like, you know. So how about when you call the cops and then the cops come by and, and you turn around and say, oh, I'm sorry, I pulled into the wrong driveway. I was uh, waiting for someone. Right, and? And then the cop finds out you're lying. Lying to a police officer and says it's a crime. Why would I lie to a police officer? Because you tell them you're waiting for No, no, no. no. Police Please come, you tell them that you're a private investigator, you're sitting in the area. That's it. The... You know, we're supposed to call police, the police department in the very beginning and let them know when we're in an area. You know? you that? Yes, I always do it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I try not to do it because, number one, uh, I'm entering a neighborhood and leaving a neighborhood without anyone knowing I'm there. So why am I calling the police? Right. Okay, I'm breaking my... Tell me that for the house stuff. I'm breaking my first rule. Now they tell you that it's required, but we both have 493, and we both read 493. We've all read 493, and there isn't anywhere in the statute that says that we're required to notify law enforcement. I don't do it. I, I've been in too many situations, you know, out in, you know, Bay County, uh, the Panhandle, where I call, and next thing I know, you know. The dispatcher is going, hey, Ronnie, we got a 1014 to 1928 on the corner of 28 and Main Street. Now, I don't know what all that means, <laughs> but everybody in that neighborhood that has a police scanner knows that they have a PI that's checked in on Main Street and 28th. And the next thing I know, I got, like, I know people know I'm there for some reason, you know, where I have a cop that just drives by and he's like, you know, <laughs> You know, and I'm trying to stay hidden, so I, I don't need that. And uh, or that dispatcher goes, you know, she knows that Mary Lou lives on that same street, so she just picks up a separate call. She goes, Mary Lou, there's a guy, private investigator, just checked in. He's down. Can you see? Him? You see him where you are? She's like, yeah, yeah, I see him. He's in a green Explorer. You see it? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I see him. He's he's faced towards the old man Dan's house, you know? <laughs> then they call old man Dan, who lives my house, my car's facing the opposite direction. So then they get old man Dan. Now old man Dan, he's been there for, you know, 125 years. He practically owns that street. He's got no problem walking up the street. Can I help you? <laughs> you know? So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like Barney Fife land when you when you get all that stuff. So I just I'm just like, no, I'm just gonna stay to myself. If if I arouse that much suspicion and attention, then I did something wrong. You ever run anyone with guns? I have, that's why I keep Yeah. No, I don't carry a gun, don't carry a badge. No, I mean nosy neighbors in rural areas. Yeah, well if somebody comes with a gun to my car, I'm gonna call nine one one and I'll have them charged. Yeah. Oh, mm. so usually come through the front door because I'm already inside. Oh, you're inside their house. No, not theirs. Neighbors. Oh. Abandoned for two years. I'm inside locking it down. Here comes the neighbor with a shotgun. Oh, wanting to know what you're doing there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Pissed. Yeah. It's like you know, call cops, go property. Yeah. I've right. never had anyone pull a trigger yet. But right. I've had them pressed up against a few times. Have you filed charges? Knows a neighbor, worried about someone stealing all the copper out of the house. You have a conversation with them, you know they're not going to do it again. Right. Once they realize what they just did and how stupid it was. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any questions about surveillance? Come on, guys. Give me something. Anything. You know what it is? We're anxious to. Has this ever happened? Has that ever happened? Anything? Okay. That will conclude our uh, segment on surveillance.
Thank you.